Hi folks, I'm Chris Callahan from UVM Extension, um, work as an agricultural engineer. I'm going to be talking today about um, a project that I've been working on with my colleague Andrew Chamberlain, who's behind the camera there, um, and Robert Haddad from Cornell University. Um, a lot of my work over the past five years has been focused on storage, uh, long-term winter crop storage and uh, even short-term storage. And one of the things that that has highlighted for me is the importance of some of the pre-storage activities, post-harvest pre-storage activities, such as pre-cooling and curing. Um, we were fortunate enough to get support from uh, Northeast SAIR in the form of a research and education grant that's supporting this work. We have a project page here. Um, I have links throughout this presentation in the upper right hand corner to more information. Um, they all start with go.uvm.edu and then a slash and then a short URL. <coughs> uh, the main project page is pre cool cure. These uh, will all be posted. Okay, and the presentations will be posted? Yep. Even better. Um, key points if you've got to make it to another session and just want to get the key points and head out, that's fine. Um, we're going to be talking about pre-cooling and curing, and these two things may seem to be quite different, um, and they kind of are. They're doing two, doing two different things, but they have a lot of similar similarities when you look at them from an engineering or technical perspective, um, such as <clears throat> pre-cooling, initiating the cold chain, but curing, providing really a suit of armor is how I think of it. They both depend on maintaining good atmospheric conditions around what you're, you're trying to um, handle. In the case of pre-cooling, it's maintaining good cool conditions of either air or water. In the case of curing, it's maintaining both temperature and humidity to make sure that curing process happens in a, in a predictable way. Um, in the case of pre-cooling, uh, many people are currently doing room cooling, uh, and the idea is you know, put stuff in the room and let it cool. Um, I think we can do better uh, pretty inexpensively and pretty simply, and so one way to do this is really think about how the cool air or cool water gets to the product to take heat out of it. Um, and that comes down to intentional air and water flow, and then ultimately measuring what we're doing. And so those are some of the similarities. So what we're talking about here is, you know, the, the complexity that goes into in between harvesting and selling stuff. Um, and it, the, the, these, both of these two processes are at the start of, uh, of this, this stage of the product's life pre-cooling initiating the, the uh, cold chain, curing and drying initiating the protection chain. So let's start with pre-cooling. It's important to remember that fresh produce is alive and um, so it is, it is respiring, um, so it's breathing, uh, it's releasing heat as a result of that, uh, it's, it's losing moisture both in the form of respiration but also in, in the form of transpiration, so just into the air. Um, it can get sick, it can even come into post-harvest sick, right? Um, and it can die. Very sad. Post-harvest, remember, is a hotel. It's, it's definitely not a hospital. Things that are bad going into the post-harvest chain are not going to get better. Uh, has anybody found a cure? No. So, uh, important to remember that what we're doing is really just trying to do our best to preserve quality. Preserve the quality we have going into post-harvest. And so we do that by and large by controlling respiration. Right? And anybody want to throw out an idea of, or a definition of what respiration is in produce? No, somebody knows. No? Well, it's, it's, it's what's shown, right? It's uh, the produce converting oxygen and glucose, sugar, to heat, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. And this is just going to happen no matter what you do until you freeze something, right? <coughs> or it dies. Um, and it's, what we do to control that is control temperature. And this is for raspberries. This is a um, respiration rate is the black triangles and shelf life resulting from uh, improved respiration is the red dots. Temperature is on the bottom, so the lower the temperature, the lower the respiration rate, the higher, the longer the shelf life. So uh, we control respiration by reducing temperature. Uh, we're really controlling a chemical reaction, the rate of a chemical reaction, which is kind of cool. Um, it's important to watch out for chilling injury. Some crops are particularly susceptible to chilling injury. Um, chilling injury can be invisible uh, at the time it happens and may not show up till much later in the process. It also tends to be cumulative. 
Uh, so it will add up over time. The more times you injure, the, the greater the damage. And also want to be careful about the, what I call delta T, the temperature difference, difference between what you're cooling with and the, the product temperature. Particularly important in hollow core products, uh, what happens is the, the cool surrounding temperature brings the temperature down inside, it also brings the pressure down. And that creates a vacuum and um, contaminants, uh, my, um, microbes can get, and pathogens can get inside the product, uh, both plant pathogens, but also human pathogens. Okay, so a number of different pre-cooling pre methods out there. Um, this is a nice resource I hope everybody in the room is familiar with, the, uh, the uh, New England Vegetable Management Guide. Um, in particular, about almost towards the end of the cultural practices sec section is table 16. Um, it's handling uh, produce for higher quality and longer market life. For each crop covered by the manual, there are, there's an indication of what pre-cooling methods are, are best suited to it. So that's a handy guide. Um, so the common methods are room cooling, forced air cooling, so putting air through the product, hydro cooling, using water to do the same thing, uh, top icing, and vacuum cooling. Just quick show of hands, how many people are doing room cooling? Putting product in a cooler to bring it down? Is anybody doing forced air cooling? Is anybody doing hydro cooling? And is anybody doing icing? Any vacuum coolers out there? All right. So let's talk about hydro cooling. Um, typically a conveyor belt of some sort that a uh, carton of produce would, would go on. It goes through a tunnel that has chilled water uh, raining over it. Um, this is a fairly short one. They, there are longer ones. The key thing to remember is that this is generally making use of a dedicated compressor that is, or chiller that is cooling that water. Um, whenever I hear compressor condenser, I hear energy um, and I hear maintenance. So that's important to keep in mind um, that it, you know, it, it does require um, control and, and maintenance as well as energy. Um, this is a bit uh, longer uh, uh, hydrocooling tunnel um, down at Atlas Farm in um, uh, Deerfield, Mass. Um, so same sort of thing, but a longer uh, conveyor belt. Um, this is used for a number of different crops, um, and it, it can be adjusted for the, the belt speed can be adjusted to get the curing, uh, sorry, the cooling just right. Um, I consider this hydro cooling too. So this is a, a greens dunk tank um, at Jericho Settlers Farm. Thank you, Mark. Um, the um, water is relatively cool compared to the product as it comes in. Um, so it's doing two things, right? You're getting an initial rinse and you're actually bringing uh, product temperature down very effectively. And you can't see it in this picture, but there's a, um, a thermometer that's handy there too. And actually that drives the water changes um, at, at this farm. So they measure for water temperature and, and change the water when it gets too warm. So that's hydrocooling. Forced air uh, pre-cooling. I really got uh, enamored with this, this idea uh, when I went on a post-harvest technology tour out in California. <laughs> and just about everywhere we went where there were grown berries or grapes, they had these uh, forced air pre-cooling tunnels. Um, and y you can see it's palletized product on uh, trays or lugs. In this case, they're packaged in, um, these are grapes. And they line the pallets up and really make uh, two walls with a, an open center section right here. There's a suction fan right there. And this curtain gets dropped, as you can see in this picture, and covers up that center section. So the fan inside is pulling a vacuum. And it's, it's not a vacuum cooler, but it's just pulling air from the cold room sideways through all the product. And I thought, well, we can do that. Here's another example of one of those, just with the pallets taken away. Pallets would be stacked here and here. Suction inlet. This one has a, an evaporator coil inside it, so it's, it's doing a bit of cooling beyond what the room is doing as well. And then it just dumps the warmer air out for the, uh, to be recirculated. Again, 
you know, fair bit of infrastructure here. I think there's a simpler way. What we're really trying to do is this, this would be a typical room cooling application where we put a pallet or even just a container, a, a crate or a carton in a room. You know, we're making cold air with our refrigeration system, but how well is that cold air getting to the center of that carton or the center of the pallet, right? Or a partial pallet? Probably not very well. I think we'll probably have extended uh, cooling times as a result of that. Extended cooling times means respiration rate stays high longer, lower quality. So I got thinking about what, what if we put a, what if we make our own little uh, tunnel, uh, forced air tunnel, just by building a small plenum on the side of one pallet and put a, a dedicated fan in there just to pull the, pull the cool room air intentionally through uh, what we've got in the cooler. And this is what we built. Uh, this was uh, truly the first build we did. You can see the, duct, the uh, obligatory duct tape. Um, so this is on a, uh, just stacked cartons on a pallet. This would normally be in a, in a walk-in cooler. So the walk-in cooler is doing the refrigeration work. All I'm trying to do with this is pull that cool air intentionally through every bit of product I can uh, to, get, to remove field heat and uh, re reduce the, the temperature. An important part of this is this, fa uh, this blower. I almost said fan. It's a blower. And the difference is fans provide airflow, cubic feet per minute, CFM. They provide airflow at fractions of an inch of pressure. So anytime we have something providing airflow, we always want to know what's the flow rate and what's the pressure. The, it, the, getting just a CFM rating on something doesn't tell me anything. It needs to be able to provide that flow rate at a, at a pressure difference. So imagine, imagine there's air moving through this produce. Well, that produce to me is just one big filter, right? So you need to develop that airflow through there at pressure. And that's why we need a blower giving us about two inches of water column. It's a measure of pressure and 2,500 CFM. This is pretty simple. Uh, plenum, we did it. Uh, and if I can do it, uh, anybody can do it. Um, pretty simple plenum. It's wide open inside there. And we use greenhouse poly to seal around the top and the sides. If we didn't have that, you'd have air coming, air basically short circuiting right through this, the closer ones and not really coming through the, the other ones. So we want all the air to come through everything in one direction. You have an opening on the other side? So the opening's in the back. This, this, uh, this, this was a little bit extra greenhouse poly. We'd probably just cut that off there. And so the back, the whole back is open. Yep. So this side, the top, and the other side are sealed. So I also got thinking about, well, what if, you know, partial pallets, first of all, we, we messed around with partial pallets, it does really well. That uh, blower really pulls the plastic in and creates a beautiful seal. I was, I was amazed. It never goes as well as that did. Um, so it's able to handle partial pallets, it seals itself. But we got thinking about, well, what about smaller growers or uh, growers who just want to pre-cool small bits of uh, uh, crop? And so we thought about doing a carton cooler too using um, a cool bodied air conditioner. Uh, we really don't have a whole lot of space to cool and not a whole lot of product to cool. Um, so that should do the job. And then we, uh, in this instance, used a bathroom exhaust fan um, that actually needs to be upgraded to something with a little bit more pressure. Um, but the idea is that you, know, you can stack four uh, one and ninth bushel wax boxes or three bulb crates or you could size this to accommodate berry lugs if you wanted. Um, whatever your containers are, size the box, put a cool bot on it, and the, the key thing is to make sure we're bringing air through the cartons and getting it back out into the space to be cooled again. And so that's what that fan is doing. So again, what we're doing with curing is certain crops for long-term storage need, um, will benefit from a nice protective layer on the outside. Um, these are th four of the crops commonly cured for long-term storage. Uh, butternut squash, sweet potatoes, uh, any, any winter squash really, sweet potatoes, white or Irish potatoes, and onions. Um, I like this picture because it's not just the perfect example. Um, shows what can go wrong as well. Um, and so most curing requires that you're controlling temperature. Um, and humidity. 
and you have some airflow. And I think one of the things that we might want to pay closer attention to is that airflow piece. I think a lot of curing is happening in very passive um, locations, oftentimes locations that aren't generally used for curing. So it's a space in the barn that we had, you know, or the loft of the barn. And it's probably providing great conditions initially. If it's not ventilated, I worry about humidity building up and the curing not going to completion. Um, and part of that comes to the fact that we don't have very good measures of completion for curing either. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. If the conditions are too dry, it's possible to have case hardening. For example, onions um, at the neck, they may, if, you, if it's too dry, this outer layer will dry quickly, uh, more quickly than the inner layers, and it won't be as dense. And so you end up with some, some trouble there. Um, if it's too humid, um, you can end up having some very, um, having some pathogens that um, thrive in humid conditions, uh, or you just won't get the, the curing completed. Uh, you also can have problems with condensation if it's too humid. Um, and then the, the reason why these are generally temperature driven and why the curing takes place at higher temperature than storage is warmer air can carry more, more moisture. So this is really about taking moisture out of a certain part of the crop at a certain rate, um, and we need air and temperature to do that. Some common curing practices. Uh, these are um, onions racked up, and this is actually a, um, an exhaust fan. I believe it's a four-foot exhaust fan that is uh, pulling air through those racks. Uh, very common practice of finding some space in a barn loft um, to put uh, garlic and onions. Um, beautiful uh, example of lots of different winter squash laid out for curing um, on a tarp. And then bulk potato uh, curing uh, up in Aroostook County, Maine. And so there's really wide, a wide variety of how curing is happening. Um, the, the other thing that's important to remember is curing uh, conditions are, are often quite different than storage conditions. Um, and one of the things that really, um, that I th one of the take homes is, are we hitting these conditions for these crops? And it's something to think about, you know, how are we confirming that we're really curing at the, at the best possible conditions? Are we measuring with a thermometer? You know, do, are, we, are we even close to the temperature that we, we should have? Um, is the humidity relatively close? So working to improve conditions uh, by measuring uh, the conditions, but also by in, imposing some airflow. And this is one reason why, to me, pre-cooling and curing are very similar, is they both depend on having good airflow for, for different reasons, but having good airflow through, through the product and trying to hit every, every part of it. Best example I have of that is onions uh, I saw recently that were laid out to cure on a wagon, um, and the top was beautifully cured, and the bottom every morning was getting condensation. And so the bottom was really poorly, poorly cured, the top was beautifully cured, the necks were great, but every one of them had this spot underneath that just wasn't getting any airflow. So um, I think it's important to try to get it surrounded with the good with air that's conditioned well. Um, most of this guidance is from USDA Handbook 66, uh, which is a great post-harvest resource. Um, the, um, one of the things that I feel is really missing is measures of completeness. And when I ask folks about how do you know you're done, it's oftentimes, well, I know the feel. right? I know the feel of garlic. I know the feel of onions when they're done. Um, sometimes it's time-driven. I do it for two weeks. you know. Um, I, I think um, we really can probably measure this better. I don't know what that answer is yet for each crop, but it's, it is part of our project, um, which has another year. Um, so I think we can get to a better measure. For example, onions, uh, I picked this up from a paper out of Egypt, uh, which is they, they actually drive their onion curing based on weight loss, which I thought was a pretty clever way to do it. You know that you're trying to dry down a certain portion of that uh, the, the skin, so you can use weight loss to do that. So measuring and monitoring um, for, for these temperature is really pretty straightforward. I'm sure everybody has thermostats on your farm. Um, 
I really strongly encourage everybody to pick up a calibratable uh, needle thermometer, instant read needle thermometer. Pretty inexpensive thing to have. Very important for knowing exactly what the product temperature is. Thermostat will tell you what the air temperature is, but to really know what your product is getting to, um, one of these is great. It's calibratable. You put it in an ice bath, you hit a button, and it calibrates itself. That's wonderful. Um, and then you can use it to actually spot check your coolers, check your wash water, see what temperature you actually have. They're, they're wonderful. $30. This is a, there are several kinds out there. Um, you know, keeping track of conditions, even if it's on a clipboard or a pocket notebook, great, great to have a record of what's, what's been done. These USB data loggers are, are a pretty nice uh, tool to have on the farm as well. We, um, we put a couple of these in uh, Green's Harvest Totes and, uh, that were being room cooled and before being washed. And it was amazing. I mean, even 24, uh, you know, 16, 24 hours after, temperature was still just kind of coming off of field temperature. They gives you, these give you visibility into things that you're not going to measure otherwise. So you put one of these in a Ziploc bag, put it in a harvest container, and see what you have throughout your process now, and think about improvements. Um, these measure temperature, and then you plug them into your computer and download the data. Uh, relative humidity continues to be a challenge to, to measure well in most of our applications. Um, the gold standard is a sling psychrometer. If you've never seen one used, there's video of me using one. It's very entertaining. Um, a sling psychrometer, you wet one thermometer bulb uh, with a wick and one is dry. You literally sit here for several minutes and sling it through the air. And what happens to that moist wick covered thermometer if you blow air over it? cools, right? So that's wet bulb temperature. It's lower than dry bulb temperature. We compare those two and we get relative humidity. That's the only way you get relative humidity is by comparing those two temperatures. Everything else is just a surrogate for measuring relative humidity. So any weather station, humidity sensor, um, they're really uh, focused more for rooms like this where it's about 50 to 70 percent relative humidity, not 90 percent to 100 percent humidity. So sling psychrometer is still my tool of choice for spot checking. Um, we, we, are, um, we have a partner company that is commercializing a patent I came up with that turned this into an electronic version. Um, VECS.org is that company. So trying to minimize the amount of time we spend in rooms doing sling psychrometer readings. So again, key points. Um, Pre-cooling, its, its main goal is to start the cold chain, initiate the cold chain, and the cold chain is what enables us to preserve quality of product going into the supply chain. Um, that requires that we do a good job maintaining air and water conditions if you're air hydrocooling. Um, really thinking about how that uh, the cooling fluid makes it into contact with the product and how we get that then out of the space to, to uh, remove the heat and trying to measure. Uh, our, our, our performance there. Curing, we're trying to provide a nice suit of armor. Uh, it comes down to maintaining good temperature and humidity conditions around the product during the curing process. Usually will benefit from good airflow, um, as, uh, as the onion example demonstrated. Um, and really what we're doing here is removing humidity. So if you're doing this in a closed room and we have product that has been curing, and that room is closed, what's going to happen to the humidity in that room? It's going to go up and it's going to saturate, right? So we need to have some way of getting air exchanged in wherever we're doing this. Get the moisture away from the product and then out of the room. And then uh, measuring for completeness, which is something we hope to have in improved uh, guidance on shortly. We are looking for some on-farm partner, uh, hosting partners to trial some of these approaches. Um, so if anybody um, believes as we do that we can do more in the areas of pre-cooling and curing and wants to uh, partner with us, we'd love to find a, a, a way to make that happen. Questions, additional input, yeah, comments? Give you a hand and Not yet.
good question. So Chris's question was, um, have we measured the improved performance of this versus just room cooling? We have not yet. Um, there's a ton of literature out there. Uh, University, uh, sorry, North Carolina State has documented this approach. Um, it, it generally cuts pre-cooling time in half, if not to 25%. So that's what we expect. We're, we're gonna be running tests on this uh, with, with actual product uh, to confirm that. Um, she already is. Yeah. <laughs> so let me re let me repeat. Uh, it had to do with sweet potatoes. Uh, the challenges in our region, we generally don't have the temperature that's ideal for curing. Uh, the approach that you you're, you've taken is a, a pallet bin of sweet potatoes with plastic over it. Yeah, like six or seven cartons. Okay, and then a space heater on a thermostat. And the the challenge you run into is humidity. I think so. Yeah. I think, yeah. We'll see some sprouting. Yep. I mean, yeah, so the other thing I've learned about sweet potatoes is they're going to sprout uh, through this process. So you are at a relatively high temperature. So we've done nothing to tell them to calm down yet, right? Um, so <clears throat> you probably will get some sprouting. That's not the end of the world. The, the plastic, I mean, one thing I would think about is how you actually move in air through those containers. Um, or even, you know, even if, do you have any air, any fans in the room at all? Well, I mean, it's usually put it in the greenhouse, and it's really like nighttime temperatures. It depends on like how what the temperature is outside and whether it's sunny or not. Yeah. So like this last year, it was cloudy, so we had just a greenhouse plastic over there. We saw a lot of condensation. Yeah. And like you know, a little space heater isn't enough to get that temperature. Yeah. So I think I think that really emphasizes the the need for airflow uh, in in all of these practices. So. It may be condensation, but it also may be moisture from respiration uh, that's hitting a cold surface up top, and you know, so it may not be outside condensation. So just put any kind of little fan in there. So I mean, at the very least, if you're in a greenhouse and you've got some end wall fans, you know, put them on a timer or you know, kick them on at a low speed. Um, just getting some air fl air movement as a first step through the through the space. So any humidity that's accumulating around what you're curing can get stripped out. So if you can get rid of that humidity, you can improve the local conditions. Ideally, you'd have something like that. We're actually actively pulling air through the, through the bins. Uh, we have a, a larger sweet potato grower I've worked with who actually built two rooms just for doing curing and storage. It, it actively pulls the room air through every bin. He's had very good results there. So greens harvested into either solid walled containers or lined boxes. The question is, how do we know whether we need to make a change? I would say get one of those USB data loggers and know what you got right now. And right? how fast should it cool down? So, right, as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah. um, so the gold, stand, gold standard is, uh, or the, the golden hour is sort of a rule of thumb. Get, get your product to storage temperature within an hour. That's tough to do. And when you start looking at it and measuring it, that is that is a very, that's a hot, that's a steep challenge. But that's the the target. So, one more. Does that help? Was there more to that question? I'm sorry. Yeah. So are you? So the question had to do with uh, Irish or white potatoes. If you're getting those curing conditions in the field for that time period, is that sufficient? I would think yes. Great. Thanks again. Thanks. Awesome.